What up, everybody? Happy Halloween. Since it is Halloween, you know what perennial issue we have to discuss today. Nope, not fun and games, not horror movies or TV shows, not zombie movies or vampire movies or trick-or-treating or costume part. Well, actually, it does pertain to costumes. You guessed it, cultural appropriation. In a nutshell, I think that cultural appropriation is a real phenomenon, and I think that when it does occur, it's worthy of criticism, even condemnation. But I don't think that a lot of the folks who are most concerned with it necessarily have the right conceptual perception of it or the right approach to it. A lot of folks seem to think that any time a person, looking at it in the context of uh, Halloween-related controversies, a lot of folks seem to think that any time someone wears a costume that depicts people from a different cultural background, right off the bat, that qualifies as cultural appropriation. I have a somewhat different take on it. I think that a lot of Halloween costumes that are perceived as offensive actually are inherently offensive, but not necessarily because they appropriate anything. Now, what is the dictionary definition of the word appropriate, used as a verb? Let's see. Ah, yes, appropriate. To take, especially without authority. That's according to this old Oxford Desk Dictionary that I got as a gift years ago. So if we understand the word appropriate in that sense, again, used as a verb, it seems that appropriation in a cultural context would have to involve taking elements of a different culture that is not one's own and claiming those elements as one's own, whether implicitly or explicitly. Last summer, you may have heard me declare that I don't think Justin Timberlake in particular is guilty of cultural appropriation. Why? Well, although he is a white guy who performs black music, I wouldn't say that based on his musical content, his lyrical content, the instrumentals, any aspect of the actual music itself, or of his style and the way he performs it, or the way he carries himself in public, I don't think that he is trying to send a message that that culture is his own. I think that he knows he's performing black music, mainly R&B. I think his fans know it. I think Obviously, his detractors know it. I think everyone who knows anything about Justin Timberlake knows that he performs black music, and I don't get the impression that Justin Timberlake has any delusions of grandeur or of originality in that area. I think he knows he's performing black music and respects that. I think this matters because a lot of the Halloween-related controversies that we see crop up every year really pertain to usually white people wearing costumes that supposedly appropriate other cultures. One of the most notorious examples of that is blackface. Every year, some fools on usually college campuses across the country or throughout North America in general, frankly, will dress up in what they may not consciously intend as blackface costumes, but that basically amount to it in practice. Sometimes they're explicitly imitating black people. At other times, they're doing other things that just come across that way, even when they have more innocent intent. Nine years ago, when I was in my senior year of college, Halloween 2007, a student at my alma mater was caught in a blackface scandal because he wore black paint on his body, dressing up as someone's shadow for Halloween. Now, interestingly enough, he happened to be running for the position of president of the student council, the undergraduate student government, at the time that this story broke. He did so without any realization of what he was really doing or the implications of it. I'm not sure how familiar he was with blackface ahead of time. This is a guy I was acquainted with, by the way. It didn't occur to him that the costume he was wearing would be perceived in that way until the controversy broke. Now, what happened at the time was that the um, Black Student Union, the BSU, held a special assembly at which he and his main rival for the USG presidency actually appeared. He was extremely contrite, profoundly apologetic. He seemed to be physically ill once he had considered the implications and ramifications of what he had done, the uh, BSU exec board was satisfied enough with his apology to not only forgive him, but endorse him for the position of USG president, which he went on to win. For one thing, I thought that was a good example of how communities can come together and really dialogue about these issues in a way that leaves everyone better informed than they were at the start. He was certainly set straight and was shown the error of his ways, and he was open-minded enough to listen to what members of the black community on campus had to say about his costume. I think that story has a couple of morals. I actually, first of all, wouldn't consider blackface a form of cultural appropriation per se. It's very offensive. It's inherently offensive. It's definitely disparaging to African Americans once you consider the history behind actual blackface routines. It originated in the minstrel shows of the 19th century that stereotyped and caricatured black people and held us up as objects of ridicule for white people's entertainment. 
and amusement. So when you look at it in that light, it becomes pretty clear just how and why it is perceived as offensive. And I think, again, it is objectively and inherently offensive, regardless of people's subjective perceptions of it. But I wouldn't call it appropriation because it doesn't involve people outside the black community seizing an element of black culture, actual black culture, and using it as their own or implicitly claiming that it's their own. Blackface isn't actually a, black, a part of black culture. This was something that was invented by white people to mock us. Cultural appropriation is not, I think, the right term to use to describe that kind of costume. Cultural disrespect, maybe, cultural caricaturing, cultural stereotyping, absolutely, whether deliberate or inadvertent. But cultural appropriation, uh, not so much. Another moral of the story is that I think when these issues arise, dialogue is the right way to deal with them, like it was dealt with on my campus nine years ago. Now, I'm not saying that particularly black folks shouldn't be offended when we see these costumes, I'm not saying we shouldn't speak out against them. I'm not one of those folks who are constantly whining about political correctness. I think people who are fed up with political correctness have a certain point. I can understand where they're coming from, but at the same time, there are a lot of, I like to call them paroxysms of outrage that erupt over incidents like the wearing of blackface outfits that are actually justified. Some of these complaints of offensiveness or what have you actually have merit. Other particular complaints don't have so much merit and deserve not to be taken seriously. These complaints and objections have to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. In the particular case of blackface costumes, I think that that is definitely something that deserves to be condemned and spoken out against. But I don't think that the people who engage in them necessarily deserve to be dragged for it, to be raked over the coals for it. It really depends on their intent and the context in which they wore the costume. In the particular context of that incident at my university, the guy who did it, like I said, he was an acquaintance of mine, and I can attest personally through my knowledge of his character that he really had no idea what he was doing. Once he was educated about the implications of what he did, he saw the error of his ways, and I'm sure he's never gone anywhere near a blackface outfit ever again since then. But um, there are also other people who wear blackface costumes knowing damn well that they are deliberately imitating black people and they at least ought to know and can know that they're doing it in a way that is disparaging and disrespectful to the black community and thus is objectively offensive. I've seen pictures year after year of douchey white kids, often drocks, on campuses across the continent wearing blackface and other elements of their costumes that show they really are poking fun at black people in a way that's totally inappropriate for which there's no excuse or justification. And then there are other situations that are sometimes misunderstood. I think it was either last year or the year before, there was a blackface controversy at, I think, UCLA. That turned out to be a case where the costume was misinterpreted as a blackface costume. You had some folks dressing up as minors and they smeared brown or dark face paint on their faces, not covering their entire skin, but just representing stains. They were actually dr dressing as minors and the idea was that the Face paint on their faces represented mud and dirt and soot, like the kind that cakes miners' bodies when they're doing their work underground. But that was misinterpreted as blackface, when in fact it really wasn't that. That's another example of why it's important to maintain a fluid and open-minded discourse about these issues and judge the incidents on a case-by-case -case basis. Not every situation that initially appears to be an example of racism actually turns out to be that in the end. Finally, I don't know if I could really address this issue without addressing the issue of free speech. Those of you who are familiar with my commentary, and if you're not, I strongly recommend you look through my archive of YouTube videos. I'm a big defender of free speech. Even in cases where people are legitimately engaging in speech that's hateful and offensive by any definition or standard, I don't believe in censorship. As I've said in the past, in a video that I put out about a year and a half, maybe a year and three quarters ago, the solution to hate speech is love speech, not censorship. You're not actually going to change people's prejudices and innermost thoughts and beliefs and attitudes by beating them over the head with a message of political correctness or sensitivity or tolerance or diversity anyway. And you're certainly not going to do it by using the power of the law or of central authorities like university administrations to drive this speech out of, uh, out of the collective vocabulary. All you're going to succeed in doing is drive the speech underground, drive the speakers into ideological echo chambers where they're only surrounded by like-minded people and so their prejudices are only reinforced and strengthened. 
And you'll only going to make them look like martyrs or perceive themselves as martyrs. And they'll be able to win more sympathy and win hearts and minds and converts to their noxious causes because you allow them to portray themselves as martyrs. So the way, in my view, to deal with these issues is not to punish them, not to punish the wearing of offensive Halloween costumes and things of that nature, but to educate people, to try to reason with people, and where necessary, to condemn them, to protest, to speak out, but not to censor.